What is going on? It's your man Ribs. So today we're gonna to be talking about Kodak Double X. This is what I've got right here. Kodak Double X is basically an antique classic film emulsion that Kodak has been making for quite some time. I think originally since 1959. And it's basically remained untouched since. And nowadays you actually can't buy this like this directly from Kodak. Uh, this film is only available in bulk rolls and I think it's about 100 or 400 feet, one of those two combinations. But either way, you can either buy the whole bulk roll and then roll it yourself into canisters like this, or you can buy it from someone who already has done it for you. I get mine from eBay sometimes and also from a friend who bulk rolls himself. So it actually becomes very cost efficient. And initially, that's why I started looking at this film because I noticed that I could get rolls for about five or six bucks at, at the most expensive. So that's a really good price when you compare it to some of the other film that is available out there. Um, this one's very intriguing and I actually didn't know too much about it before I started using it. So kind of dove in, started messing around and then retroactively started to learn a bit. My initial use for this was street photography. Given that it was so cheap, I felt compelled to just kind of take it out there and do whatever I wanted with it. Additionally, I would actually push it as well. I think when I first started shooting it, it was around December of last year. And of course, you know, the, the, it gets dark pretty early there. And also here in London, you know, it gets kind of cloudy and overcast. So light was very challenging. Thus, I would take this film and push it to 800, even 1600. And I really like the result. It gets this really beautiful, crunchy kind of like, um, I don't know, artistic look, let's say. And it delivers something right out of the box. So that's what initially drew me to this film. But let's kind of talk some specifics here. So this is cinema film, and it's meant to be used under very controlled kind of strict settings, meaning if you're a cinematographer, you can control all of the light that's around you, whether you're shooting outdoors or indoors. And that matters a lot because given the fact that you're supposed to control your light very, very well with this, it's a very challenging film to use when you cannot control your light. And for photographers, usually that's gonna be the case. So this isn't actually ideal when it comes to, you know, outdoor situations when there's a lot of kind of dynamic range in your scene. Um, so that's kind of the downside of this film, but that's also the upside. If you want a film that has a lot of kind of freedom and versatility to use in all kinds of lighting situations, this one's probably not gonna be it for you. But if you like kind of a film that has constraints and let's say a certain character that you have to kind of get no matter what you do, then I think this is a good option. It kind of goes in both different directions. And ultimately what would happen there? So if you use this in very uncontrolled light situations, especially where the dynamic range is quite broad, what you're gonna do is have to expose for either shadow your highlights and basically give up on one or the other one. You can't get both of them, you can't really average them out if the scene is actually that wide. Uh, here, you often will get blown out highlights, especially if you're in a very open area where the light isn't blocked by any buildings or there's no, any, there's no shadows or anything like that. That can be a bit challenging, but again, I tell you that, that actually might be a good thing because it'll first challenge you to kind of mess around with the film and, and deal with its characteristics but also it might deliver something, a look that you probably wouldn't have gotten otherwise with any other film. Sometimes blown out highlights actually look pretty good. Some of you might be going nuts right now talking about blown out highlights are horrible, I can't deal with that, I need all the dynamic range. That's good for you, but sometimes it will look good. So in terms of blown out highlights, like I said, you could get some stuff that looks pretty cool. You've actually already seen these images. Uh, they're a little bit bright here because of the exposure for my face, but nonetheless, these images right here, portraits that I did outside, and this was before I kind of knew how aggressive the blown out highlights would be. And honestly, I really love how these turned out. Detail in the highlights in the background around the person's head and behind them, it's kind of irrelevant because, you know, I'm not taking a photo of the scene, I'm taking a photo of them. And I think in this case, the blown out highlights gives that big, bold white background, which I think is really nice. And it contrasts so beautifully against the actual image itself that's in exposure in the front. Um, and this image right here, kind of same idea. You know, there's, there's a, supposed to be sky and, and I guess information around the person here, but it's a bit irrelevant because again, the person is my subject here. If this environmental portrait was supposed to really showcase and tell you where this person is, then maybe that's not ideal. And therefore blown out highlights would not be a good thing. But in this case where they don't really matter, I think the blown out highlights are nice. And obviously disregard this huge um, light leak right here. Pretend that it's not a light leak and pretend that there's a proper exposure for that part of the image. Um, and it would look so much better. But either way, blown out highlights around my subject don't really bother me. I think they add to a look. And I think this is an example of many where the blown out highlights and kind of the, the limited latitude here that you have with the highlights, I think it could be a really cool stylistic option. So if you don't care about controlling all that information, then I think this is a really good way to go. So I actually wanted to put this to the test. I have two images right here that I printed in the darkroom. 
and they're of the same exact scene. It's basically just a scene out of my window and you can see, like in the distance, you can see uh, central London and then of course the buildings in front of me in my neighborhood and so on and so forth. What I did was I actually took this right around sunset and from what I remember, and you can see a sample photo here, you'll have a lot of detail in the sky, really good texture and you know, some color and all of that. Obviously in black and white, you're not gonna get the color, but I was curious to see how much texture and detail I would get. And it turns out I didn't get too much. I didn't do like a super precise exposure, but I did kind of just average it out using my Sekonic. And basically, no matter how much you burn this image in the darkroom, you're not really gonna pull out much detail out of the shadows. Uh, on the scan, you can get as much as you can see in this particular sample right here. But in the darkroom, you really gotta get after it. Um, in fact, between these two images, the highlight section that I burned in this one right here was three times the exposure of this part of the image here, which is kind of the baseline, you know, middle exposure. So that's very interesting and you know, it kind of speaks to this film. Again, you really have to control your scene because if you don't, you're gonna have a very, very limited capacity towards your highlights. And again, that's okay, but I think in a scene like this, where the whole point is to showcase kind of the entire environment, it doesn't really work. But if a different scene where you're doing something different, maybe a portrait or a street shot or something, that could work. Here's actually a sample of a street shot that I did. This isn't something magnif magnificent or anything like that, but I just really like this photo. You know, there's some motion blur. The light was kind of a challenge. I was probably shooting at 1 125th of a second. Plus this kid was running by, so I very quickly panned to catch him. But I really like what it did in this scene. As you can tell, there's some blown out highlights. The contrast is quite strong and I didn't manipulate this. This is zero contrast per se. Um, but as you can tell, it gives you a look and I really like it for this image. And I think this is where this photo really shines for the average photographer. That is just street photography when you're kind of walking around, not really caring about what's going on in your elements. You just want to capture images and you want the film itself to give you a quality or a characteristic. Again, if you want control, this is not your film. But if you want the film to do it for you, you don't really care what the end result is and you want that charm for that specific film, this is a really good option for that. So I'm definitely gonna keep using this film. Um, like I said, it's very affordable if you, especially if you bulk roll and it's just a fun film to use. It's kind of different. It gives you a bit of a different look from a lot of the standard films that we all tend to use often. So I definitely recommend if you haven't tried this to give it a try, but definitely keep that in mind that high dynamic range images are just not really gonna look that great if you care about having detail in every single part of that image. I am curious, has anybody watched any movies shot with this film? Um, I tried to do a very quick search on YouTube and I couldn't find any sample clips of motion picture with that. So if there's a classic film that you know was shot with that film stock, let me know because I'd love to check one out. All right, that's what I got for this week. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and leave me a like. And of course, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. To the next video, yo. Peace.